Okay, it says preparing, setting up your meeting for YouTube Live. So let's see. Yes, I think we are live. Yeah. Well, um, let's start off uh, formally by saying uh, welcome, hello, and uh, from Pakistan, it's Zaryab Hashmi. From uh, UK, we have our dear Radabai, and from Australia, of course, our very own uh, Mr. Will Marcus. And uh, today, we uh, in the second episode, the first we would, uh, it's in the process of editing, so first episode you, you, we would have on the, our YouTube channel in the next few days. This is our second episode in the program we call point to ponder. In these programs, we are trying to promote concepts and uh, ideas uh, workable all over the world, wherever applicable to, um, uh, to improve the standards of living for every, everyone. And uh, these uh, programs have uh, for now, uh, the, our first program was on uh, poverty alleviation, rather poverty elimination as will pr prefers it to to be. And uh, our second program today will be based on uh, agroforestry, where, uh, where Will would explain uh, some concepts that could be applicable and workable for a country like Pakistan and wherever it, we have a similar sort of an environment and uh, atmosphere. So uh, let, the, without uh, further, uh, further ado, let's uh, start off the proceedings. Uh, I welcome uh, both, uh, you, uh, both of you gentlemen. And Razabai, I would uh, want you to um, take it off from here and then uh, initiate officially. And then, of course, we can bring Will in the discussion to, uh, to, to talk on the topic. Thank you very much, Zubi. Thanks for the, uh, the platform. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, another subject that's very dear to our hearts, um, if, if I may add that Will is one of the foremost in this field as well, having done projects around the globe. It's something that is very, very passionate about, just as he is with the po uh, poverty elimination side of it. And in some ways, it's very similar. It leads on to this subject as well. Uh, so, Will, I'll pass it over to you if you can lead, and then also how it uh, uh, fits in with the Pakistan uh, geo uh, geography as well. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Raza. Thanks, Zubi. Um, it's, uh, it's always a Let me uh, first uh, uh, mute uh, all. And uh, now I would ask both uh, of you gentlemen to unmute uh, and uh, continue, please. Okay, thank, thank you, you. Zubi. Thanks, Rosa. I, I uh, again, I just want to thank you. I'm just so um, enjoying working on this platform, the gray, the gray room with you. It's, um, I think, it's an important uh, platform, and certainly the the topics that we're covering are, are of global importance. And um, and so I'm happy to talk about this stuff uh, so that people can get a greater understanding of what's involved. So. Um, I, I'll just tie in the whole agroforestry, food security issues um, back with poverty firstly, so that you can see the linkage. Um, we've always uh, found that, um, you know, people who have less uh, need food first, food, shelter and water. And, um, and what we quickly discovered was that if you can engage these people in the creation of food, shelter, and water, then you actually literally kill two birds with, well, metaphorically kill two birds with one stone. And so in terms of forestry uh, or food security, if you can take someone who's chronically unemployed and give them a job as a farmer, not only do they have an income, but they have food. And this is on the premise that we're not talking ha hand to mouth uh, agriculture, we're talking proper commercial agriculture where farmers get paid a fair, a fair amount for a fair day's work and then they get paid for their produce as well, which unfortunately is not the case in a lot of areas, but we will always work on the premise 
that farmers should be paid very well for creating food because it's such an important um, uh, part of um, existence on the planet. Uh, so um, whenever we're looking at assisting uh, a community to come out of poverty, one of our go-tos is to look for the food solution and uh, because they're, they're off, often uh, malnourished, uh, they don't have enough food and the food quality is too poor. And, um, and so when you have malnourishment, your brain development is, is not great, particularly with children up to the age of seven. And so that puts them at a disadvantage. It's harder for them to uh, concentrate, do all their schooling, hold down a job, all of these things. So um, nutrition is incredibly important. We, we um, uh, and, and I'll try and give you some examples about this, but in terms of um, uh, food security, there are, there are a bunch of aspects to it and not one solution fits all problems. So problems have to be assessed. Um, and so we usually step back. If we're asked, like, can I give you an example? Uh, we were uh, we, we were asked to have a look at the British Virgin Islands after they were um, demolished by Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Mary uh, Maria, and um, I, I was there six months after the devastation, and they were still on their knees. They didn't have proper food supply. They didn't have water sorted out. Electricity wasn't on correctly. It was in some areas. They were running gen sets everywhere. Um, and, uh, and half the buildings were demolished and were only just starting to be rebuilt. The hurricane just flattened everything. And, um, and, the, and the nature of that hurricane was that it was a Category 5 slow-moving hurricane, so it was the worst possible storm. And I've seriously never seen that sort of devastation, and I come from a country uh, that sees 7 to 12 cyclones a year, and a cyclone is a... Southern Hemisphere hurricane, um, just spin in the opposite direction. So, um, and so we know all about um, anti-fragility when it comes to withstanding cyclones. Um, and so I've seen devastation before, but nothing on this scale. And it was because they weren't prepared. Admittedly, it was a horrible storm, huge storm. I've never seen every leaf on every tree ripped off. It was, everything was bare. It was spectacular, the, the, the energy that must have been involved. And the mangroves, which are a very tough uh, tree, mangroves as thick as your arm and, or your leg, some of them were quite big. They were, all of them were snapped off halfway up. The wind speed was so great that it just took them and, and snapped them in half. And mangroves just bend usually. Uh, I've never seen this before. There were 30 and 40 foot fiberglass catamarans, and I'm talking 1,000 of them, picked up and flung hundreds of metres inland. Uh, I, I nearly cried. I like boats. I've never seen so much devastation. So, so their cry was for anti fragility. So, let me explain what anti fragility is because it's kind of a newish term, but it's incredibly appropriate. Most people understand what uh, resilience is. You know, we, we have to have a resilient society. We need resilient infrastructure. And the problem with resilience is that you can build something strong enough that it won't break up to a certain point, and then there will be a point where it breaks. And then resilience, you can only be so resilient and then it fails. The point of anti-fragility is that it accepts that things will break. There'll always be a storm that's bigger, a flood that's higher, a volcano that's stronger, a wind that's stronger. There'll always be these things that are, um, or a drought that's longer. These things will outlast us. There'll always be one that causes failure. And so anti-fragility acknowledges that and says, okay, we acknowledge that there's going to be a failure in the system. And uh, we're going to plan for that. So that as soon as this thing has passed, and in this case, it was Hurricane Irma, <clears throat> the next day, we will have water, we will have food, we will have electricity, and we'll have emergency shelter. And so anti-fragility is planning for that event properly. And strangely, no one does that very well. 
And so it's easy enough to do, but I tell you what, it's very hard to get people to plan for that condition when the sun is shining. And even with the British Virgin Islands, we came in with an anti-fragile solution for them and they needed it. They knew they needed it. There was lots of energy to get it done. Uh, it didn't get done. And, and this was because Brexit got in the way the next week. And so British Parliament was tied up with Brexit and, of course, a project of the size of making the BBI um, anti-fragile cost so much that it had to go through the British Parliament for approval. Uh, and then I don't know what happened. And then we had another, another hurricane and then there was a change in, in politics. Politicians all changed and then uh, COVID hit. So, unfortunately, the BBI never got to implement and I hope they do. We're still working with the people on the ground to get there. But the anti-fragility solution made sure that we could have power, water and food and some shelter immediately available so that you didn't need to have the first responders coming into the ports. Oh, look, and the problem there was that all the seaports got ripped out and blown away. So they couldn't get first aid coming in. Red Cross couldn't get, no one could get in. They had to chopper things in very slowly and there were barges and it was tedious. So you've got to plan for that so that it all just comes out of where you are. And one of the big things we found in the British Virgin Islands, and this is a sort of an interesting little micro history of the, the islands, um, the BBI used to be the food bowl for the Caribbean, it used to feed all the other islands. And it did that because they had rich soils and the people were hardworking farmers and they could generate a lot of food. But most importantly, this was the shipbuilding yard for the British. So when the British would come across the ocean and stop in the British Virgin Islands, they'd chop down the trees, repair and make new boats. And so it became a shipbuilding island. And so the British Virgin Islanders could use these ships. They learned obviously how to build ships and they could transport their food all over the islands in the Caribbean selling food. So that, that, they had food security, uh, they had excess, and that was their economy before the banks came in. Mm. The banks came in, then everyone could take out a loan. The government at the same time decided to um, stop being a landlord and allow um, private title, and so they subdivided the whole island and sold most of it off to the local inhabitants who were free men. Most of them were uh, black slaves out of Africa, but they were the first uh, black slaves to be released uh, as free men in, I'm pretty sure it's the world uh, at that time. And so they had their own settlement and uh, a tortola. And, um, and so they got about feeding people. When the banks came in, uh, farming in the British Virgin Islands is kind of the hardest sort of farming you'd wish all, all, the, all the slopes are at least one in two and up to one in one slopes. They're horrible slopes. So you have to have great legs to get up and down the, 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 yeah, the slopes all day. The ground is pretty rocky. It's full of minerals, but, man, you're digging in rock and schist and shale and it's just hard, hard work. And then you've got to get the water up there and yeah, it's buckets and irrigation. And so not easy, uh, but these were strong people and they did the job, right? But... As soon as they had an opportunity to take out a loan to buy their land and sometimes their own little business, usually taxi licences, that whole economy fell down and very quickly there were no farmers to the point where today Tortola imports over 95% of its food, most of it from the US. And unfortunately, the port... Uh, charges are extremely high, and so the food is extremely expensive. And, um, and so people spend, um, and I've got, to, I've got to recall the amount. This may be a wrong figure, but it was shockingly high. I think it was 70-something <laughs> percent. Bless you. That was something like 70-something percent of the domestic economy was spent on food. Now, just relate that back to your own experience. I mean, I live in a developed country and we spend about 15% of, on food of, of our, our household income, 15%, 20%, 20%. 
depends on how fat we feel this that week. But, you know, 70-something percent is insane. So these people were eating. They live in, they live in um, uh, paradise. You know, honestly, it's beautiful. Uh, and yet they're actually in poverty. It's kind of a strange, strange arrangement. But you couldn't tell that to anyone there because uh, everyone has pride. And, and, and But when you look at the figures, it's like, man, you don't have enough money to go overseas or or have a, a decent holiday. You just got to keep doing what you're doing. Or, yep. And um, and then a hurricane hits and they get a lot of aid and so that gives them a bump. But it, it, it's all about the food security. So we, we, we came back to them and said, look, can we trial a watershed, 400 hectare area? Uh, what we want to do is set up an agricultural college there and we want to re-establish agriculture in a very special way. And we had a whole lot of, uh, a series of difficulties there, um, but to give you to give you some idea of, of the methodology of the, the repair, um, we established in the master plan for this. Remember, this didn't get built, unfortunately, or hasn't yet been built. But in the master plan, there was already a college, but it was a maritime college, so it was about you know uh, seamanship, uh, engine repair, uh, boat repair, boat building this sort of stuff. They had a few other courses and some other stuff. Um, and we said, how hard would it be to add an agricultural college? We'll write the courses for you and and then uh, we'll train up the lecturers, help you get them and, and we'll start you on the way. And they were they were happy with that as so long as we built that into the capital cost of the, of the planning. And, uh, and so in the Valley we're working with, we had the opportunity to not just create a solution, but to create an enduring solution because the people we would train would continue to do it after we left. This is very important. It's not good enough to come in and create a solution and then disappear. Um, that's That doesn't serve anyone. Um, Something sustainable. So it has, it's sustainability, yeah, and, and, and truly sustainable in, in that sense. So the, the agriculture that we wanted to bring in, so with agriculture, right, we had the soils. Soils were fine, a bit hard maybe, but uh, let's face it, the earth was a rock before plants started breaking it up into soil. So, um, and it's a bit the same way. A good, a good forest can turn a rock field into a, a, a fertile uh, field within a lifetime, if not sooner. Uh, trees are incredibly powerful in that regard. But the rocks hold all the minerals. So, so long as the plants and the trees can access the minerals in the ground, they'll grow. And there's a lot to be said for, you know, know this species needs these minerals and that needs this. And, you know, there's a lot of that. But the, the fact is that if you've got a well-mineralised volcanic ground, it'll grow anything. And all you need is water to activate it because the trees and the plants are the actual machinery that you break the rocks apart to create clays, which then becomes humus, which then becomes topsoil. It happens very quickly if you know what you're doing. And so, and, and I guess there's a parallel in Pakistan because I'm sure there's not a stony desert or stony ground uh, areas uh, in Pakistan. Am I right? You yes. are. Yes. And I was actually going to bring, bring in that uh, because South Punjab side, um, Zubi will know better, but South Punjab, uh, the desert area, and it's exactly this uh, situation where there's this scarcity of water, um, mm. which the land is just being reclaimed uh, or, or being sort of um, contracted because the farmers can't use it because of the scarcity of water. Um, mm. I know we touched upon it, but Islamabad is further north. This is in the middle of the country, if, if anything, south, you know, the whole Sin province. Yeah. Uh, what do you think, Zubi? Yeah, I would say, sadly, uh, Pakistan has failed to, to put uh, the resources uh, to the right use over the past uh, 20, 30 years. All we've seen is... Uh, uh, depletion more than anything else and because of mismanagement but but just to to answer quickly uh, what uh, will is referring to yes uh, we have a, a certain uh, salt range uh, we call it where uh, there's uh, there's a lot of uh, minerals 
I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's called uh, the mineral land, I would say, in our water treatment industry. Because, uh, but of course, we also have uh, some minerals which we do not require in, uh, to have in water, some which minerals which are harm, harmful, uh, like uh, excess of arsenic and uh, excess of nitrates yeah. and, uh, and sulfur. He, he, but yes, he, he, uh, but you're right. You're, you're saying the ground is saline, the groundwater is saline? salty yes 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 see and exactly. this is natural there there's salt in all ground all over the planet without exception there's always salt in the ground if you don't have enough fresh water in the ground the salts appear and they rise to the surface and then the trees start sucking on salty water and they die they get die back now exactly. and, and this is a very simple physical mechanism if you have enough rainfall and you have moisture in the ground, say down to three metres depth of fresh water, what we call the freshwater lens, um, fresh water is lighter than salt water and so it naturally sits on top of the salt water and suppresses it. It keeps it down. If you suck away all your fresh water, say you put in bores and use it for irrigation or agriculture and you remove all your fresh water, then what happens is the salty water moves up and displaces it. And this is a mechanism of failure all over the planet, India particularly. Like the food bowl in India between Kolkata and Delhi was enormous. It fed the whole country. And now look at it. It's a, it's a mess. You can't, you can't drink the water. You can't eat the food off there, according to the World Health Organization, because it's so toxic, thanks to fertilisers, pesticides, herbicides over a few decades. Um, and, and so you've got to be careful with these macro uh, environmental issues when you're dealing with them. And, and I'm going to touch on that a few times because it's very important when you do remediation of damaged landscapes like this. I'm going to touch on remediation as well because it's so important um, that you do it as if you're, you're nature, that you don't do anything that nature wouldn't do itself. That, so... So if you can't find that mechanism in nature, don't do it is what I'm trying to say. If you remediate in that manner, two things we discovered, it works faster than chemical or mechanical means that are currently being used, or three things. It, it, it's, it's a better outcome and it's an enduring outcome as you reinstate natural landscape function. The landscape wants to go back to where it needs to be and once you've done that it'll just hang in there so long as you don't damage it again by for example sucking all the fresh water out with deep deep water bores and uh creating a situation where you have a vacuum and the salt waters rise again so that's just one simple thing but i, I will go back to water because water is incredibly um critical in this and that's often why uh agriculture fails and in the british virgin islands what happened when the brits arrived um, unwittingly, they chopped down all the trees because that's where they got the timber for the boats. And, um, uh, and so they lost their forest. And then the islands got covered in a bramble. And they also brought goats and sheep because when you travel halfway around the planet um, and you land, you need protein pretty quickly so you don't get scurvy. And, um, and so they populated the, uh, the islands with these hoofed animals, which destroyed all the all the vegetation, but allowed a very um, thick bramble, you know, maybe two, two and a half metre high bramble with thorns thorns on it, literally the size of that pen, just very sharp and very long all over it. Um, and, and some trees called turpentine trees, which weren't really um, adding to the uh, ecosystem tremendously. They had their place, but so th there's this, from, I'm a Lord of the Rings fan, so I, I would describe this as Mordor. That's how this place looked, seriously. If you've ever enjoyed that movie or read the book, you'll know what I'm talking about. And, um, and so um, now the American Virgin Islands are right next door, exactly the same geology, topography, everything's the same. The British, and, and they were never developed like the British Virgin Islands where the trees were chopped down and the sheep and the goats were brought in to graze it back down to rock. And so what happened is that 100, 150 years ago, uh, the, the forests that were on the island, so the, the American Virgin Islands are 
rich tropical islands with palm trees and rainforests all over them, and waterfalls and lots of water. Rainfall is great. The British Virgin Islands, by chopping down the forests, they stopped an incredibly important function that forests have, and that is to attract moisture in the atmosphere. So we need forests to move, to chill the air, and a, an enduring law of physics is that water vapour, so this is moisture that's in the air, will always move towards the colder atmosphere. So it's like a vacuum. So if it's colder over here, that the, the moisture in the air will move towards that colder spot. And while the forests were there and the water was being um, evaporated out of the leaves in the forest, there's a chilling effect from the evapotranspiration from the forest. And it's significant. Um, and to give you an idea of how significant, if you had an island the size of Tortola, which is the main island in the British Virgin Islands, um, and it's about 20 kilometres long and about three or four or five kilometres wide, um, if you... Um, uh, Please, no British Virgin Islanders, ring me up and tell me I'm wrong. It's 18 and a half kilometres. It's about that. Okay. So if that, that island um, with the forest over it originally, compared to the air temperature on the ocean, that island would have been about 12 to 19 degrees Celsius cooler because of the evaporative cooling of the, of the moisture leaving the, the leaves of the trees and becoming a water vapour. So the science is that as the water changes state from a liquid to a vapour, it grabs all the energy in the area into the water molecules and chills the air. Okay? So it cools the day, which is great for agriculture. And obviously at night, we've all seen dew on the ground in the morning, all of that water comes out at the right moment, usually three o'clock in the morning, something like this. And it lands on the ground and irrigates the ground, all of it. And so what we've probably, what humanity has not known until rather recently is the actual amount of water that goes through that cycle. Um, the energy, uh, okay, uh, let me see if I can throw some interesting facts. There were some Russian, Russian scientists who captured this knowledge and I won't go into the whole story of that because it'll take a little time, but they basically turned some uh, satellites who were interrogating the edge of the universe. They turned them around and looked at Earth with these satellites. And uh, they were looking at all sorts of spectra. They were not just optical, uh, but they had that. And what they could see is they could see water vapour and they could see it in a lot of detail and they could measure it really accurately. And... And so they could see how water vapor moved around and clung to forests, and they worked out how much uh, water was moving around. And and I guess um, from that knowledge, they could see the value in maintaining forests because they were actually the irrigators for the whole region around the forestry. So I. I um, yeah, I'm going to have to tell you the whole story. Sorry, this is going to drag out a bit, but if you don't get this, it sort of this underpins a whole lot of other science to do with agroforestry, which is really rather important. So, so the, the scientists, the Russian scientists involved were part of a huge scientific effort uh, in Russia. The um, and Vladimir Putin uh, set it off. Uh, the, um, the there's a lake in uh, in Russia. Um, called uh, uh, my, I'm going to have an, an old timers moment here Lake um, uh, it'll come to me as I'm talking but there's a very big lake, it was one of the largest freshwater lakes um, in the world and it had three river systems feeding it and um, <clears throat> and anyway over the last 10 or 15 years, 20 years uh uh, it was so big that it, it actually supported three fishing fleets, three townships on the side and three separate fishing fleets could fish it and they, they provided a lot of food, obviously, in that region. And the rivers that fed it supported agriculture that fed most of Moscow. 
this huge agricultural zone. Anyway, what happened was that the water started disappearing and the level in the lake went down and down and down and down until it was just a mud pie in the middle and all of the fishing fleets were aground in mud in, in the middle of the lake. It's quite famous. And, um, and it, there was a panic because the food security was really well, it's a serious event. It was quite critical uh, for the country uh, that this major food bowl was drying up, so no fish and then all of the farmers in the area were not having water to irrigate. And so what they discovered, yeah, so Putin said, where's the water going? Who pulled the plug on the lake? Where did the water go? And he got everyone. So they've got a big scientific organisation uh, where all the scientists are sort of plugged in. And he put it out there, a bit like a competition. I don't care what science you're doing. I want to know where the water's going. If you have an idea, tell me. Drop everything you're doing, find out what's going on with the water. And the winner was these astrophysicists who turned their telescopes around and stopped looking at light years and started looking at kilometres. And they found where the water was going. They actually saw where it went. And so that, what, what was happening, and so I'm going to quite use a term here that most people won't be familiar with, and it is a biotic pump. And it's a coin, it's a term coined by the Russians doesn't quite match what it is, but that's what they call it. So this biotic pump is a natural phenomenon that occurs all over the planet. And for the last century or two, humans have been destroying biotic pumps at our own peril. And the, the, the death of the biotic pumps is why the water was disappearing. So what the biotic pump was doing is that when the water in the, um, in the lake, this is a very big lake, it's an inland sea, was evaporating, it was going from a liquid to water. There was evapotranspiration going on to a certain extent there. The forests lining the, uh, the three river systems coming down into the lake were also doing evapotranspiration and the air over them was chilled and it was cooler than the, than the, the air over the, over the lake itself. So the water vapour coming off the lake would head up the rivers. And what they discovered was that 10 times as much water... Now, not on, on this lake, but on lakes that were functioning because they moved the satellites to investigate a functioning system, that on a fully functioning biotic pump, 10 times the amount of water that was coming down the river per hour was going upriver in the air. And, and it's like, oh, that can't be, or the air would be thick with water. But it, it's not because the cross-sectional surface area of the river may be, you know, a few hundred square metres or a thousand square metres, whatever. But the cross-sectional area of the air tunnel with the water vapour moving in it was square kilometres. So it was magnitude, 100 times magnitude, the cross-sectional surface area, and the moisture moving up the river system was slower similar, a bit slower than the speed of the water uh, coming but down. How were they able to measure that? From satellite. They have special equipment that they were using to look into the universe. They turned it around and they could actually see the water vapour. In fact, the same scientists at the same time, because they had all of this very, very uh, powerful equipment focused on atmospheric moisture, discovered seven very distinct types of water vapour and we always thought there was only one. <laughs> yeah. It's not. There's yeah. seven. So you know, that's a side thing. But, you know, they, the, the, the amount of water moving upstream was like, you're kidding me. So you got one unit coming downstream and 10 going up. And so the reason was moving up because the, the evaporation that was occurring out of the forest leaves was chilling the air and sucking water up, literally creating a a vortex, if you want to call it that. And as, and as, and it, it, because the, the air temperature over the forest was always higher than the air temperature over the water, the, the, the moist air coming in from the lake kept ramming the air above the river, up river, and up and up and up like a piston pump, just pushing, pushing, pushing. And so the longest, bio, and this is a biotic pump. The longest biotic pump they found was two and a half thousand kilometres long in Africa, longest functioning one. So, uh, and their their call on that was 
there is no limit to how long these things can be. So long as you get a differential in air temperature and you have water vapour, they will keep moving the moisture. And so this is the mechanism that all continents were irrigated for eons. When we started chopping down the trees around the rivers, we broke the pumps and the moisture couldn't get inland to precipitate or come down as dew and irrigate the landscape and then seep back into the river slowly and end back in, out in the ocean. We broke that cycle. Now, they know now, they've actually done some calculations on the amount of energy transfer. So this is all about energy. This is not really about water. I, I, yeah. This is kind yeah. of a little, little difficult for people to fathom, but yeah, the water is the byproduct of the energy transfer. So with the transpiration, you get energy trapped by the water molecule and you get a chilling effect. And when you have dew in the morning or rain, the, the, the vapour becomes a liquid and liberates all that energy and releases all that heat. And so that will warm the night. You cool the day, you warm the night. The almost... of the heat energy is what you're referring to, right? Yeah. It, and it's just, a, this happens every day and every night all over the planet where you have forests. Now, they calculated that the amount of energy transferred in this process is one of the biggest energy transfers on the planet. Of course, we receive all our energy from the sun, pretty much all, um, notwithstanding volcanoes. Um, but all the energy that we accumulate comes from the sun. And so when you, when you um, uh, look at all the big, the major energy transfers, we have wave energy, we have volcanic energy, you know, the, uh, you know, the whole tidal thing from the moon, that's a huge amount of energy. This energy transfer every day is up with those in terms of the, the gigawatts that are involved on a night and day process. We interfere with it at our own peril, and that's what's happened. And the problem is that most people haven't worked that out. And so, I mean, I've been banging on about this now for about four or five years at forums and conferences. People are getting out there. The problem is that the science was in Russian and the Russian scientists don't really interact very much with the English speaking scientists. So there's this inertia in getting the knowledge like this into you know, Western science. It's there now. Um, my, my, uh, one of my business partners, Sergei Karabut, he's Russian. I'm lucky that he's Russian. And we were onto it very early, and so we've been able to, uh, um, you know, develop systems that can utilize this biotic pump. So in in Russia, is, is it a common phenomenon now? Hmm? Sorry. In Russia, is this a common phenomenon to control all this? No. No, you would expect that it would, but the problem is that the implementation of this science is not easy requires a lot of cooperation between different levels of government and land um, stakeholders, let's call them, and it just couldn't be done. They're starting, you know, strangely, with our help. Kind of we have to go, has to go full circuit and then we go back. And, and so they talk to us about setting up areas, but every time we start, someone starts a war, and um, last time it was Crimea, this time it's going to be Ukraine. So we can't get any traction in there. I, I, I just love my life. Uh, but it's there waiting to happen. Okay? And, and so if we can reinstate a biotic pump by replanting the forestry that is along the side of the rivers, then we can bring it back. So what was happening, particularly in this Russian lake, was that the farmers who were in the, the, the three sectors between the three river systems farming they are under pressure to produce more because russia needed more food and so their natural go-to after they'd tried gmo and extra fertilizer was to just make more land so what they did is they started chopping into the forests around the rivers to make more farmland for them to grow crops and as they did that they reduced the biotic pump reduced it and reduced it and they killed it when they killed it, they didn't get their water because the water coming out the biotic pump was irrigating their farms. To compensate for not having the irrigation, they dropped down deep water bores, they removed the saltwater lens, the salts rose, 
the soil soured, they could grow crops. Well, is no, there right. any particular uh, type of trees or forestry which works best, or is that dependent on the geology and the topography of the, of the you know, the location? Yeah, yeah, very good question, actually. Um, uh, yes, yes, and yes. Um, the uh, topology, geology, obviously has something to do with it. Um, certain species will grow better in certain climates and, and ground. But we have to be um, cognizant of the fact that we're changing the microclimate, and so we can't predict the outcome uh, based on the current. So we're, we're after an outcome. We can't pretend that it's not going to happen by using a species that's relevant now but not in the future. That's badly put, isn't it? Uh, let me give you a good example. Uh, um, and I know this was happening with the, um, uh, the 10 billion tree tsunami uh, and, and in that eucalypts and acacias were being used uh, in the plantings because they're desert hardy. Um, and, uh, and that's great. And, and they would survive uh, quite well with very little water. However, these trees, particularly the eucalypts, the gum trees, they don't share their water. So they don't do evapotranspiration through the day. So they're not chilling the air over them. Um, and so you're not creating a chilled air and you're not attracting moisture. Let me talk a little bit about, and, and, and so it failed in part because of that. I know there are sort of mechanisms why that's not working as well as it could and it, it can work very well. But if you pick the wrong species, it, it can be a failure. But particularly to your, trip, to your question, um, uh, Raza, the, the, um, I always think that if you're going to plant a tree and you need food, make it a food tree. Mm -hmm. don't, don't muck around. Put a tree in that will, will be productive with food. But, so that's, that's kind of a given for me. And if you plant enough trees and enough species of trees, they'll support each other in what's called an allopathic effect where they share the minerals what the minerals that one tree doesn't want, another tree will want. And so they can, they can survive quite well without fertiliser if you know what you're doing in that regard. Uh, fertiliser obviously always helps. Um, and if you, if, you put a, um, if you put enough of these trees together and you can get the, the cooling effect uh, that a forest should normally um, create, you will attract moisture naturally because the forest is there. And I'll give you a very good example. It, it, to, to navigate across the Pacific Ocean, which is a huge space with very few islands, and they're little islands and they're dispersed, um, the, the Polynesians in their canoes would always look for a cloud on the horizon and they would, they would sail towards the cloud because inevitably the cloud was hanging over an island. Mm. Why was the cloud there? Because it was attracted by the cooler air and that's where the water vapor was, and it was raining on the island and nowhere else. So they could just sail off into the distance, into the wide blue yonder, and if they're aiming at a cloud, they'll hit land every time. Now, this was the problem with the British Virgin Islands. They'd taken their forest away. There was no cloud hanging over the BVI of the British Virgin Islands, or Tortola in particular, and, and so it never rained. So strangely, the rainfall in the British in, on Tortola was about a quarter that of the rainfall on the equivalent American Virgin Islands because they had a forest and the BBI did not. And so that's how important forests are. They create the opportunity for water to come towards you. And so this chilling of the atmosphere is very important with agroforestry. The agroforestry creates the water that it needs. So you end up with a chicken the egg situation <laughs> you can't grow your forest unless you have water. You yeah. can't have water unless you grow unless you have a forest. So you sort of, how do you get your forest to attract the water? And so there's this moment where everyone thinks you need pumps and pipes to uh, excite, uh, well, to, to get the water from a remote location and bring it in onto your onto your trees that you're trying to grow until they get to about a year and a half, two years old, where they they're becoming are quite active with their transpiration and they can chill the air and then they start to do the job themselves. Now, I might say that if you did this in the middle of the Sahara, well, good luck because they can only attract um, moisture a certain distance and 
obviously the size of the forest and the, the distance of any water vapour from where you are are important factors in this, but you have to be close to water to attract the water. And so we, um, we worked on this for a while because um, doing it with pumps and pipes is so expensive that it can't be done. It really can't be done. The cost is horrendous. The gigalitres of water you need. Um, and so um, we were lucky enough, again, through Russian scientists, um, to look at some climate control equipment that had been developed by a scientist, um, Sergei, and, um, uh, and his, his equipment had, has military application and is, is used to clear military airports of um, uh, mist uh, and uh, fog mm -hmm. uh, and, and to chase rain away. Uh, so, so it was more of an accidental invention. Yeah, what he was doing, his invention um, creates negative or positive ions, and it's like a mast, it's like a, a big TV transmitter, aerial, and with a, a very modest amount of electricity, you can create a lot of ions, and um, you can blast them up into the air, and negative ions tend to chill the... Uh, this is, I'm going to abbreviate the science because I don't want to go into all of it. It's just way too complex. But essentially, there's an effect where the negative ions clump particles in the air. Everything with a positive charge clumps to them. And, and, and there's a net chilling effect, I guess you could call it, combined with um, agitation of these physical particles getting quite big in the air, bouncing water uh, vapour out and making it rain or precipitate or land as dew. Um, so negative ions will make water come to you and, and these generators can have an, an area of influence of about 100 kilometres radius. Uh, this is a well-proven science. There's been lots of research on it over the last five to 10 years. Um, yeah. It's now well understood. Uh, and if you generate uh, positive ions, you do the opposite. You push the moisture away. Uh, there aren't masts at the moment that can do both, but that's not an impossibility. So just imagine you had a pole that you planted somewhere and you turned it on to attract moisture or you turned it opposite charge to, re to repel water. Um, essentially what we've done is we worked with Sergey to come up with what we call an, an e-forest, an electronic forest. So one of these mast, masts would replicate the impact of a natural forest. We don't want to go military scale and create drought or flood. You know, that's, we don't want to do that. We want to gently entice the water back and forward as if there was a forest, because the intention is if we put an e-forest in the ground, the moisture will come. So we'll get our cloud landing over our island with an e-forest, and it'll rain every afternoon. Uh, we'll get dew in the morning, and so that's enough moisture to grow a forest from seedlings without having a bucket brigade, without having pumps and pipes doing it, which can fail. And the beauty of these systems are so long as they turn on, you've got your power and they can be run off solar cells. They don't even need, they don't need that much electricity. So long as they turn on, um, you will have water. Okay. And, um, and so we've developed a system where we use these particularly designed ionic wind generators to attract moisture to where we want them to be. Now, because they've only got a uh, hundred kilometer uh, radius of, uh, of influence, and to be honest, the size we're using, um, it's really more like 85 kilometers where they, they start to have a really significant impact. There is impact at hundred kilometers, but it's not adequate. Um, if we planted one of these e-forests every 85 kilometres from the... Uh, and well, I'm going to use a real example here. We did this with the BVI. We just needed one mast in 400 hectares to, you know, to attract moisture back into that valley to rehydrate it, to get that going. That was the plan, right? But um, in uh, a project that um, you guys are both aware, aware of, Rosa and I, and I are working closely on this uh, just outside of um, Islamabad. 
the uh, Islamabad Global Leisure uh, City. It's a city that will feed itself. It's truly autonomous. People talk about green cities, but they, they don't really... Most cities and aren't really green. Even the yeah. You tend to apply this uh, concept in that, right? Yeah, and, and I'll explain how it is. So the, the and, and I won't preempt the, the, the sort of uh, the subject of city building that, but that city uh, is designed to um, house people outside of Islamabad as a satellite, but it's also designed to feed itself. It won't be a burden on any of the systems. And so the area that we're planning just south of Islamabad, yeah, it's pretty dry. Uh, there isn't enough moisture for um, uh, agriculture uh, of the sort we need. Um, and so our, our, what we just, what our solution is to get 12, 12 e-forests and plant them at equal distances from the Gulf of Arabia up the watershed all the way to the site. Mm. And so what we could do is we can entice water that is evaporated off the, off the, the sea there through the air from e-forest to e-forest to e-forest until it got to the top and then we drop it on the ground. And so we worked out that with that system, we could move about two and a half uh, gigalitres of water a week up to, up to the region, which would be enough water, irrigate the farms that we needed to feed a quarter of a million people. Okay, so a pretty, pretty serious bit of equipment, um, proven system uh, can be implemented, right? And the beauty of this is uh, uh, that uh, it's, it's kind of almost too much water for us. We could afford to drop some of it on the way to light up, uh, to uh, not light up, what am I saying? To hydrate the landscape all the way up the valley creating agriculture all the way to the top, which would be a net benefit to us because if we do that and we're growing forestry up the river system again, then we can dismantle the e-forests, turn them off, and nature would do it. We'd have our biotic pump turned on because originally there was a forest running all the way up that river system to its limit, and it did it by itself. What we're doing is reinstating what once was and all that has to happen is that people don't come in and chop down the forests for, for fuel. How long, uh, how long would it take uh, <laughs> the point of uh, installation of uh, the first concept uh, of, I mean, starting from down south to up north where you uh, want to target uh, the, uh, the, the transfer of yeah. uh, energy or to how long does it take for well, we could, trees to and uh, build that mm. so from from you know pressing the button about six months to have 12 e forests assembled and shipped to pakistan they'd be erected in the next six months uh okay. obviously the ones closest to the gulf would be turned on first they'd be the ones going up first They'd go in. They'd start immediately. It doesn't take long to put one up. You know, maybe two weeks. It's not hard work. One specialised team would just keep moving upstream, uh, um, up the watershed, and so um, we, we'd be immediately irrigating the ground within you know 24 hours of um, turning on the first e forest. So the one closest to the Gulf would be on first. And, um, and then the next one's on in the next fortnight and the next one and the next one until we have them all on. And so once you do that, uh, a few things happen. If we didn't plant a thing, you'd start to get all the weeds would start growing back. And that's an excellent thing because the weeds repatriate the damaged ground. A lot of people don't understand the function of a weed in a landscape. They think, oh, they're demonised because, you know, someone has to sell herbicide and to make money you have to demonise what you're trying to kill. So the weeds have a function. God didn't put weeds on the planet because he was a bit remiss on that day. They have a function and their function is to remediate damaged soil. Now, the beauty of weeds is 
they grow nominally 10 times faster than any other growing thing, green growing thing. They have what's called a high calorific value. So they're turning over energy 10 times faster than most trees and most crops, uh, which means they're very fast little engines. And so, uh, and that's why weeds spring up and we're all shocked. Oh, where do they all come from? You know, it's banged there and they're suddenly they're three metres high and they're flowering and they're, you know, kill the weeds. But what the weed's doing is it drilling a hole down into the ground. Most weeds have a very deep taproot. So if you have a, a weed that's three metres high, you know that there's a root that went three metres down. And so it's doing two things. It's drilling down into the clays and rock and transferring it and sending carbon down there and minerals. And what do you do if you're a mediate ground? You spike it, don't you, to aerate it and get moisture down here. Weeds are doing this for you. They're very, very good at it. They're, they're sprouting up this way. They're shading the ground, allowing the moisture to collect. Otherwise, it just evaporates off if you're looking at parched ground. They're creating a home for insects and small birds and animals, which then defecate in the area and die, and that creates fertiliser, and the weeds die, and you have this mulch. And then the next round of weeds comes up. But this time, there's secondary growth as well. You get little trees and shrubs and weeds, and so this is three months later. And when that, when that cycle is done, these secondary growth comes up. A lot of them, it's acacia-like stuff. It doesn't last very long. It has a lifespan of seven years, maybe. But that creates enough shade and, and it's, um, humus and, and, and hydration in the ground to allow the tertiary growth where you get to proper trees. So this is if we did nothing. That would happen by itself over a period of, I would say, 10 years. Uh, for me, to, wait uh, f- step in, um, um, Zubi. I, I, I know the audience and you, yourself. Um, the project that we're referring to, we're at a, a planning stage with this. So, apart from the water corridor that we're talking about, bringing water from the uh, Indian Ocean up through the country, which sounds a, a phenomenal and just an amazing project. But this whole city concept that we're talking about is, once again, sustainability, self-sufficient. Water is scarcity in Pakistan. It's something that we are addressing. But this whole project will enhance job creation, the whole uh, leisure facilities. We want to put Pakistan on the map. That's the idea behind it. And this project will be so unique in so many different levels. And uh, as time goes on, we, we will start to start to show the projects to the key people and start bringing this in. But what we've assembled, as you can appreciate, is this world-class team who are experts in their own fields. And we've com- combined them all together to, um, to enhance this project. But I don't want to give too much details on it. I know there will be lots of questions coming out where people will be asking more and more about it, but all will be shown in good time. Um, yeah, it is amazing uh, the aspects that your project intends to cover. I mean, uh, I'm just amazed by the, the concept. Well, I remember we, we, we've only touched upon the water side in this particular talk, but the whole energy thing, energy is, is a huge problem in Pakistan, as, as you well know. And we want to tackle that. The whole transportation mechanism, we want to tackle that. And it comes with its own funding. So that is, mm-hmm. you know, that's a separate issue, which we, we are addressing as well. So this project will be groundbreaking. It will be um, so unusual and really world-class. We're we're hoping that it's a a pilot model that people can copy. We'd be more than happy for people to replicate it all over the world because it truly is energy efficient, water efficient, food efficient, waste efficient. I I measure... Yeah, please, please go ahead. I was just saying that, you know, people talk about cities being green. This is a green city. Um, but they never, they never say why it's green or how they measure it. And I think there's only one true measure, and it's a scientific measure of, of greenness for a city. 
or a building for that matter, and that is, does it import or export energy? Does it import or export water? Yes. Does it import yeah. or export food? Yeah. Does it import or export waste? And if the answer is it zero, no energy in, no energy out, it's self-sustaining, well, that's the baseline for me. Zero is the baseline. If it creates all the energy it needs and that's it, that's, that's wonderful. If it exports energy, uh, that's better. If it creates all the water it needs and no more, that's a zero net outcome, that's great. If it exports water, that's better. So these are the measures. These are scientific measures. And, and someone can sit down and do a PhD on any of these things and create a new scale for greenness that would be meaningful <laughs> because most of the green measures, oh, dude, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble for this. Most of the, most of the green measures are totally meaningless. They're kind of arbitrary. Uh, yes. and, and I know this deeply because I, I used to write programming for some of these guys. And I went, what are we, what are we doing this for? It doesn't mean anything. Where's the well, science? Window, you know? window dressing, as they say. Well, it's uh, for political yeah. Oh, yeah. benefit. Oh, it's got it's got five stars. It must be green. Yeah. No, it doesn't work like that. So no, for this city, the whole city is set up to be at least zero net impact on the environment, and we're working on it being much better than that. But when that's, you see that. You could, you could, you would want uh, people to replicate this model elsewhere. It, it, it yeah. brings in my mind that uh, do you think, uh, be it Pakistan or be it any country uh, in, in this regard, uh, there would be a certain amount of uh, envir environmental studies that would be required before the plantation of the trees. Just like you mentioned that there are trees that you should not plant in this concept and then there are trees that you have to. So you, oh, they yeah. have to, there, there has to be a decent amount of study involved uh, by, by scientists uh, like Sergey for that, for that matter. Well, yes, ab absolutely. You're totally right. I come from a building background and, you know, we, we grow up at the dinner table talking about lumber and steel and stuff. And the, the adage that I learned that's so true is that you measure twice and you cut once. So all of the groundwork that you do, you understand what you're doing before you cut it because once you've cut it, it's cut. You know, you, if you've mucked it up, you, you, you've got to throw it away and start again. So, so yeah, all, all of the base science needs to be done thoroughly. Having said that, there's a lot of nonsense science out there. Um, and I say that with love because a lot of people put their lifetime into something which they feel is important, but it just misses the mark um, because they're not... Scientists have this wonderful thing of zooming in and zooming in and zooming in until they're looking at they're looking at that little thing there. And so they've forgotten how it fits into the whole planet. And, um, and so I, I'm the reverse of a scientist. I'm, I'm a... Uh, I look at the macro in, uh, relationships of things because I come from a master planning background. So I, I go, well, what if you do that? Isn't that going to happen? And why, you know, why are you doing that? Don't stop, stop doing that. And, and so I, I'm looking at always putting together scientists who understand the, the, the macro issues of what they're doing and then can help with that. And so we assemble teams who can create uh, enduring solutions, and of course, as I, as I said before, if it if we can't see that science already happening naturally on the planet, then we can't use it because something's going to go wrong. We don't know what. This is a, a a real good good example of you don't know what you don't know. Mm. So the only way to do it is to copy working systems, and there are plenty of examples out there, and the biotic pump is one of them. These scientists in Russia discovered the biotic pump, been going since the planet was a thing. And so now we know what a biotic pump is. We're all busily trying to recreate them. And so how do you do that? Yes, we can use an ionic wind generator to attract the moisture. No, we don't use the military scale ones. We could cause so much damage, it wouldn't be funny. So we create one that is replicating roughly what a forest would do. And so the, the planet will behave as if you're a forest. And so you fill in the gap. 
Once the gap's filled in, you've built your forest, you pull down the equipment and it's done. Job done. Move on. So uh, let's talk about more about um, food security um, because um, there's a couple of other examples I'd like to talk about. One of them is a food cube. Um, uh, and that was a response that we had to this piatus problem that I spoke about uh, last time with, with the poverty alleviation. Um, this was a, this was a, uh, a community of about a quarter of a million people who lost their income because they were what's called rag pickers. They would uh, pick the rags and the rubbish out of the municipal dump and uh, recycle it, upcycle it, eat it, whatever, to survive. And um, when the, the city... Uh, rightfully had to close the dump because it was so full it was becoming dangerous. They were having rubbish avalanches that were killing hundreds, if, if not more people, uh, when, they, when, when the rubbish cascaded down on top of the people, undermining it by rag picking. Um, and they buried it with three metres of soil. Uh, these people didn't have an income all of a sudden. And so uh, it became very obvious very quickly that um, uh, they needed food. And, of course, there were the, the missions bringing in trucks with food to feed people. And it's a lot of people to feed, uh, you know, every day. So um, uh, we came up with a solution and was part of the uh, poverty elimination uh, solution we had for that area. But one of these things was a thing that we, we described as working title only, a food cube. And so a food cube uh, was derived as a vertical farm, so it's basically aquaponics. So we're growing fish and fruit and vegetables uh, in water. Um, and we're growing vertically. So we were building up uh, mini high rises, if you like. Um, and so we, we got about first understanding what the need was because um, the number of people in the area was significant. Um, we found that within a four, uh, four 500 metre radius in any point, we would transcribe three and a half thousand people would be living in that eight, 900 metre diameter circle. Very hard to do the census on that. We did it a few ways. Eventually we found that anecdotally we were about right. So we worked on, no, we worked on a four, 500 metre radius circle because in the tropics where we were, and because the ground wasn't flat, it was quite hilly, um, an older person or a younger person could only really walk 400, 500 metres effectively on a daily basis. Uh, after that, it was not reasonable. It's just, it couldn't be done. Too hot, too hard. And so we had to design it around um, the people who, not the fittest people, put it that way, but the elderly and, and young kids who were sent off to get the food for the day because the parents were working, you know, the little kids. So... Um, so we transcribed a, a, a circle based on or the walking distance from the furthest person to a food source. And then in the middle, we put a food cube that people could walk to and walk home again. And the food cube then, therefore, because we transcribed 3,500 people, had to produce enough food to feed 3,500 people. So what does that look like? So then we had to work out how big a food cube was. And we ended up with a, with a cube roughly 60 metres on a side. So 60 metres by 60 metres by 60 metres high. Now, that's roughly a 17-storey building with four metre, three to four metre floor to floors, depending on what we're doing on the floors. And so every floor... And so we developed a, a, a steel frame system which was earthquake-proof, would would rattle and move in earthquakes because big earthquakes are in there. So the building wouldn't fall down. Easy to erect, quick to erect. And then we'd fit it out with aquaponic systems, fish tanks and um, um, grow beds uh, for, um, uh, for, for the vegetables and the, um, the leafy vegetables and, and fruit. Um, and so we developed this system so that most of the floors had fish in the middle in big tanks, 20,000 litre tanks, and the, the growies around the outside where they'd get a bit of natural light. And of course, this would all be supplemented by um, a, a light system 
which was designed specifically to um, entice growth uh, with high nutrition. And light is a very interesting thing. As I've touched on before, it's all about the energy and there are very many different forms of light. So we found out quickly that LED lights work, but not very well, and eventually becomes toxic. So we've got another source of light, which is designed to create optimum growth for the genetics of the plant. And it's designed specifically for the cycle of the plant's growth. So as the seed is germinating, it needs different levels and types of light to when it's growing, to when it's flowering, to when it's seeding. Like so these stages of growth all require different types of light. Um, this is almost esoteric knowledge. It's real science. Um, the frequency of light can impact the growth of a plant significantly. Uh, this science has been going on for 10 years now. And generally, uh, and I'll give you some, I'll give you an example. Uh, hemp, familiar with hemp? Um, good for making fruit. I'm wearing a hemp shirt, right? Uh, and um, um, you make rope out of hemp. There's all sorts of things. You can eat hemp if you need to. It can, can have building products. Hemp is arguably a weed, but if you grow hemp under this, the right light conditions, it will reach maturity in half the time and it will be about 30% more massive at maturity and the quality of the hemp will be the best there is because you optimize the DNA of the hemp plant. These are very significant changes. Yeah, We're not is. talking little stuff. Yeah. So, so by using the right light, growing fish, growing fish is very hard. It's probably one of the hardest things to do. They're so sensitive. They will die if you sneeze at them. So it, it's, it's all about getting resilient fish because the protein in fish is incredibly high. And, and if you understand with aquaponics, I'll just touch on that for those uh, who ha haven't heard of aquaponics before. The fish live in the tank and they are excreting into the tank, into the water. The water then goes out of the tank and then floods through all the grow beds where we have the vegetables and the fruit and the plants need what the, what the fish are excreting. That's the nutrients. They suck it up. They love it. So they're removing it from the water, essentially filtering the water. Plants get their nutrients. The water goes back clean to the fish tank and the fish mess it up again. And so it goes. And, and so there's this lovely relationship between the two. And so long as we feed the fish, so there is an input and we can grow certain types of weeds like duckweed, fish, a lot of fish love duckweed. It's a weed, so it grows very quickly. You can feed them on things like this. You have this symbiotic relationship with the waters just going backwards and forwards, and backwards and forwards, getting clean, getting dirty, getting used, being used as fertilizer. It's a lovely system. It doesn't need a lot of tweaking, but you've got to be very careful because as I said, fish are very sensitive and you can lose 10,000 fish bang overnight so once you get once you've got that little system going what we did as well so we're growing this over about 14 floors fish and plants on the top floor we thought now oh, let's grow some dwarf citrus so lemons limes mandarins this sort of thing they're very discreet little trees they have a three or four meter diameter growing pattern we could put soil on the roof uh, we could almost, we could even do it aquaponically, but we thought, no, let's do soil on the roof. And, um, and then we'll have about 20,000 chickens on the roof, which is 60 metres by 60 metres. We have a chicken coop. And we have all this ground that they can scratch in looking for worms, worm farm, of course. And, um, and so the chickens are, are putting manure everywhere and they're aerating the ground. And, um, and then when they get, and, and they're going back into the chicken coop and they're laying eggs, and you can manipulate an egg race so all the eggs end up on level two where they're packaged and sold. And when the chickens get to a certain age, they become chicken breasts and chicken thighs, and, and they're sold as well on level one. And, um, and so it goes. 
and, and the trees are happy they're getting natural fertiliser, that crop can be um, harvested and sent down to level one for sale as well. So we worked up this view cube where the basement was for recycling and energy issues and maintenance. The ground floor was the supermarket where we sold fish, poultry, uh, and, and vegetables and leafy greens. Um, level, uh, the first floor above that um, was um, uh, admin and storage, some cold storage. And the level above that was packaging, processing and packaging. And then every floor above that was production. Now, let me, let me just sort of give you a little bit of insight of why this works so well. In a normal production food cycle, farmers, maybe 50 or 100 kilometres over here, are growing food. Um, they harvest the food. They have to cold store it, and then they have to put it in a cold storage truck, and then they have to put diesel in the truck and drive to a distribution centre where they unload it into another refrigerator. Day three, let's say, from harvest, where it sits until it can be distributed, sold on to a retailer at best, sometimes another distributor. And, um, <clears throat> and so by the time it's gone from that main distribution point to, the, to another distribution point before it goes to retail, it might have taken a couple of months. And so the food has been kept gassed to stop it over ripening. Uh, potentially, uh, it's a lot of energy has go gone into its refrigeration and a lot of energy has gone into transporting it from here to here to here, by which time it of gets course, to the shop. Of course, the cost goes and up as well. And then what happens is that you've got to get in your car to go to the supermarket or use some form of transport because these things aren't on every corner like food cubes are. You've got to put it in the car, you've got to take it home, put it in your fridge. And so by the time you get to eat it, it's at least 16 days old and up to six months old, sometimes a year. Some fruits can be stored for a year with gases. And so it's not fresh, really. And so the energy in it, the nutritional value is going down as a result. I can have an argument with a nutritionist about this. Um, food, food is so much more than energy. You know, it's, it's nutrition and... Uh, it's life-giving. So um, we eliminate that with a food cube because we're growing the food constantly. It's being sold the same day on the ground floor by people who take it home the same day and probably eat it the same day or the next day. And so there's no refrigeration to speak of included. We have some small refrigeration on on one of the lower floors because you don't get to sell everything on a day while well, you need somewhere to put it to keep it fresh. It comes down and it's the first thing sold the next day. But we've eliminated essentially the refrigeration. We've eliminated all the diesel because all the people buying the food here, they're arriving by foot or bicycle or at worst, a little step through motorcycle. And, and so just the energy involved in delivering the food has gone from a huge amount of huge number of kilojoules to very modest kilojoules. That in itself is impressive. Now the problem we've got is that that's all that's good, but we have to offset a capital cost in building a 17-story building with all of the aquaponics infrastructure in it. But the equation is that it works. It is still more efficient than going through that whole using all of that land to make food. It, it, we can feed, all right, it's time for my calculator, <laughs> so I can't do this in my head. And of course, you I know, just... because it's grown in a controlled environment, the um, loss due to uh, climatic or any other sort of, uh, you know, uh, problems are, are reduced so much because it's all done in a controlled environment. Absolutely, and there are no insects. No, not bad insects. We have all the good insects because we have beehives inside the, the food cube to pollinate everything. And um, but we don't have predatory now insects. Now that you've got your calculator out, 
what is the per square foot or per square meter cost and uh and what is the and uh, the return per, per square meter so to speak so that we could actually sure. assess uh, how it translates uh, for for a, a certain community yeah sure so there's 54,000 square meters of grow bed whether it's water or or or, or we're growing uh, vegetables and leafy greens 54,000 square metres on a 3,600 square metre footprint. So it's, it's space efficient for a start. Um, we, if you divide that by 3,500, we're using 15 and a half square metres for every person, man, woman and child in that, in that village to feed them. <laughs> so this, this is quite efficient farming. Yeah, now this is um, the square the, How do you do the cost factor on that? So the, the units, to build one of these things in um, Metro Manila in the Philippines is about 50 million US. Okay. Let's see if I can do some quick maths here. So 50 million. That's ex exclusive of the land cost, right? Yeah, which is granted by the government because we're solving a big problem for them. They're not unhappy about that. Um, uh, I won't do the full maths here, but I've done it before. And the feasibility is that there's about um, allowing for failure because there's a lot of failure with aquaponics, losing stock and not all of the fruit is, and, and leafy vegetables are going to be sold not 100% of it, so allowing for 30% waste. We know that um, if we sell the food for half the going rate in a normal shopping centre, half, the payback period, the return on investment, will, will amortise the capital cost of the construction over... It's about 25, 27 years. Now, that's a long time. It's not commercial. But given that the building will last maybe 200 years and the aquaponics will last arguably 20, 25 years, um, it's viable. And if we were to charge full price for it, we would halve the payback period. So we believe, for a start, that it's important to feed people properly because they get the right nutrition and they get the right amount of food, then they will have the energy to do whatever they're doing better, whether it's menial tasks or mental tasks. And, and so it's beholden on us, particularly in this circumstance, to create a circumstance where they can get their nutrition at a price they can afford. Now, there's a couple of blowbacks on this which work to our favour. One is that we directly employ out of the 3,500 people, 15% of them in the food cube. Now, the flow on effect of that is that those people can support another four people. And then the people who buy the food from us, are secondary users like restaurants, cafes, who create a product from the raw food, whether it's, you know, you know, a, a restaurant making meals, it doesn't matter. Um, that represents another big proportion and then they support their families. And so by putting in a food cube, we don't employ everyone directly, but we create an economy that's adequate enough to allow the engine to start and then all the other stuff comes in because people have enough money then back in the system to go to the laundromat, to buy the dry foods that they need, to, to, to do the transport and pay the guy who, who runs the taxi. So the economy starts to kick in again, and it's all because of the food. And if you remember what I said earlier, we get, we get to kill two birds with one, one stone because not only are we creating the food to solve their food crisis, but we're employing them. And so one thing does two things. And so in terms of our time spent, it's very efficient. Uh, a lot of things aren't efficient like that, but food is. 
So um, I guess the food cubes for us are important. Um, a lot of people then suddenly think, well, a food cube is the answer to the world's food crisis. And it is not. I've got to be really emphatic about this. Mm. It, it is designed specifically for high-density slums where people can't move. Their economy is there or they need to be there for, for filial reasons. They look after the grandparents. or not, not everyone can move around. Their relationships are all there. So when you have high-density living and you've got nowhere to farm, going up in a vertical farm is the only way to do it. And so food cubes are a very specific solution for big slums. And once, once you get one set up, it's remarkable um, from our modelling, it's remarkable how effective they can be to break the nexus on poverty. It's not the yeah, only but thing, of course. I, believe that, um, I, would, I would request um, both you gentlemen for uh, another uh, session uh, altogether on uh, this food cube concept because... Uh, because I think it's not only for uh, high density slums. Uh, I think uh, in uh, in a country like Pakistan, this could also be workable uh, for uh, uh, high density metropolitan cities of uh, of uh, our country. Because uh, because the thing is, yeah, yeah, please. Oh, Zubi, you're so right. Uh, um, but let me just temper that statement with some other other things. We we. Uh, our, the remit that we've set ourselves is that we want to help the poorest of the poor. If we go helping everyone else as well, we'll never get the job done. And so yeah. one of the big problems we, we had with... Um, but, you know, and, in a country and, and like... So Pakistan, people, yeah. Well, you know... Sometimes, the, sometimes to get to the, to the, to the actual beneficiary, beneficiaries, you have to first pilot a project or concept in a main city for, for at times in a, in, a, in a country like Pakistan, you have to give them a pilot where you can, you can show them that this is not just applicable uh, in the slums, but also everywhere or anywhere no. where there's densely population. Someone could run with it. Yeah, someone could run with it in high density residential area of Karachi, for example, or Lahore, at, yeah. you know. It doesn't matter. But uh, but if we're fo focused on assisting the people who really need it, we've got to focus uh, on that. And so one of the problems that we struck with this was that, okay, you generate all of this cheap food. What stops some person from over here in a rich suburb driving over, doing their shopping for half price? Organic, high-quality, fresh food. Yes. And undermining the effort you're making. And so we solved that very simply with Jala. And I don't know that I, I need to go through what Jala is again, but it, yeah, it's I remember. digital digital economy that, we've, that we're, we're planning for people who are unbanked. They don't have a birth certificate. They don't have identification papers. The banks don't want to look at them. And the term unbanked is, is, is what they end up wearing. So they can't get a loan, they, you know. So Jala substitutes the banks, gives them the capacity to borrow small money, even borrow for a home, um, gives them equity in that financial um, space. J Jala can be set up that it will only sell the food to people with Jala currency, mm. currency, Jala credits. So if you don't rock up with a Jala card, you don't get the food. <coughs> It'll only come out through it. So you can only pay with Jala. So if you're, if you're earning your income on Jala, or you can get a fiat currency and put it into your Jala card and it converts into Jala um, credits, you can then use that to buy your food. So we were going to control it that way uh, uh, so that truly the people, and, and so we don't have to monitor that. It just, you can't buy the food if you don't have a Jala card. You can only get a Jala card if you never had a birth certificate and you're living in poverty. Kind of so it tidies that right up. So that's how we manage that. And I'm not saying that a, a food cube is not an ideal solution for somewhere, say, like Karachi, where there is some some poverty, but it, it you know it's not it's not everywhere. It's not extreme, right? So people can take advantage of this, and, and you can imagine. Okay, let's just say you halved the value of food for everyone in a city. 
what does that do? You know, it, everyone's got their own domestic economy, haven't they? You, you generate as a family a certain amount of money and you spend a certain amount of money to live. And what's left over? Well, you can do things that you want to do or if you're in poverty, you can't. You always don't quite have enough. And so, um, and if you start, so there's two sides to the equation. You can either earn more money and that's not often easy or possible for people in the lower socioeconomic areas, or you can spend less. So you spend less means you get less usually unless you can get value. And like a food cube creates value because now they don't need to go public transport to get their food. They can walk to get it. And the food is half price and it's better quality. So they've got the energy and hopefully can focus, do their jobs better and earn more money. So it solves part of that problem. So if you, if you like we were saying before, how the British Virgin Islanders pay 70-something percent of their gross income on food, well, if you could knock that back to 20 or 30%, that would be a huge impact for them. And that's, why, that's why it's important for them. It's not just about eating food, food security. It's about lifestyle. It's about this whole concept we were talking about where you can survive and most people do survive, but we should all be able to thrive. We all should be able to thrive. And it's just this inequity in the system that creates this poverty, uh, poverty gap. And, um, and, and how do you fix it? This is one of the ways food keeps, um, though we haven't got one built yet, we know they work. It's a tried system. We're not reinventing a wheel. Um, where we're just strategically positioning it, sizing it, and offering it in a way that impacts uh, a society in dire need uh, with the most impact. And that, that takes a little bit of thought, but it, it's not hard to follow. I think I just rolled it out. I think you can understand clearly how you come about sizing it and placing these things so they're optimal. But what I like about them is that they're so energy efficient. It's a joke. We are actually worked out um, with... Um, Solar collectors, you know, photovoltaic cells or solar solar cells. I'm not sure what you call them in Pakistan, but you know, you know what I mean. Yeah, collect sunlight, turn it into electricity. There's the new type. It's a crystalline form, and it's flexible. It's I, I call it uh, PV3 because it's Mark III. It's not the old PVC uh, photovoltaic system. It's not the current one we're all using. It's it's the new one that's flexible. You can you can glue it onto cars. You can put it on your backpack. And you can create electricity where it's thin so thin. Thin film. thin film. thin film. Yeah, you call it thin film. So um, we can apply thin film to the screen that we surround our cube um, on, on all five sides, the four sides and the roof. Uh, and and <laughs> the beauty of thin film is that so long as you have an incident angle of 15 degrees or, or greater from sunlight, it's op operating at optimal efficiency, whereas PV photovoltaic 2, <clears throat> you need a perpendicular. <clears throat> so there's your cell. The sun really needs to be coming in perpendicular to the cell to get the maximum effect. If you're at 45 degrees, you're, you're losing efficiency immediately, whereas PV3, because of the crystalline structure, it's receiving the sunlight at full, full tilt until you get down to 15 degrees, and then you're missing its glancing. So it's very efficient. So if you put up the walls of a building, so long as the, the corner of the building is facing the sunrise and the other corner is facing the sunset, it's always going to get sunlight at some part of the day and across the roof will. So you're generating electricity from all the walls and the roof. And uh, we worked out that on a 60 metre cube, we can create all the energy we need to run the lifts, to run the lights, to, you, to run the pumps and the cold rooms that we need to make that whole system work. Yeah. And the screens, and we were working, we were working with the Chinese company um, to develop it so that we could apply the thin film on a perforated stainless steel mesh, which was going to be the wall. So the, the building wasn't airtight. It allowed natural breezes to come and go through the edges. But the perforations in the screen were like security screen. 
wouldn't allow the bad insects in and out um, and wouldn't let people climb in and steal food or do damage. So the security screen had the thin film applied to it, then it was perforated, and then we just used it to attract, uh, um, to get our electricity. So, you know, the, that's just a little side story on the thing, the efficiency there um, with the solar. Um, and then the other problem that we always have is water. How do, you get, how do you get that much water? With a closed system, you're not losing much water because you're not getting evaporation as much as you would in a normal field. There isn't runoff that goes into the streams. Uh, you don't have over-irrigation and all these things. So we don't need as much water as you might think, but still there's a considerable amount of water needed. In the tropics, we were getting two... Rainfall. It's, I think it was about two metres of rain uh, a year. And what lands on the roof, 3,600 square metre roof, we collected all of that. That would represent about 30 or 40% of all the water we ever needed. And the rest we would have to pick up from a local water supply somehow and filter and use. Yeah. So there's some of the other uh, bits associated with that. So vertical farming. Um, it's good in one regard uh, in that um, it does the job. Uh, and the problem we have is the capital cost because someone has to fund that in the first instance. And, um, and so, again, you know, we were looking at funding. We, there's always ways to fund these things. And sometimes the government put their hand in their pocket and assist. Um, but usually we find that impact investors or crowdfunding even can work. Uh, with these things, so we, we have we have a source of funding for for pie artists for the for the we've got um, is it five food cubes in that area as the starter. That was the first thing we were going to do. We worked out the locations and how it was all going to operate. So um, yeah, I guess uh, uh, and people say, well, do they have to be that big? And the answer is no. It just depends on the community you're feeding. But obviously, there's a, you have to optimise the, 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 the economics of it. And the reason it's a cube is that a cube is the, the largest volume you, you can build for the lowest cost. A sphere is the largest volume you can encase for the lowest perimeter, but don't try building a sphere that big. You'll, you'll, uh, you'll end up having uh, construction issues. But a cube is easy to build. And like I say, it holds more volume than all other forms generally for a very simple build. And so that's why we worked on a, on a cube. And um, uh, the, it, it's really just mathematics, the establishment of it. It's, it's quite elegant, simple master planning mathematics. And once you get that right, um, the production of food is the, the, the operational side of it is the, is the real trick. Getting built, no problem. Running it, big problem. Get well-trained people, make sure they know what they're doing and uh, keep the quality high and, and, and make sure that the system doesn't get hijacked by people who want cheap food who can afford real food. It, it's got to be done by people who care. Um, and, and that's an issue in its own right. And on that basis, um, we were going to um, form a consortium that involved the local churches, the government, and, and ourselves as controlling sort of steerage on the whole thing mm. to maintain the whole point of the food cube. And, and so what's interesting about food cubes is that they're not designed to feed people in poverty. They're designed to bring people out of poverty. So what happens when they're out of poverty? Still have your food cube. Um, and the answer is that is that uh, we can, there's two things we can do, and we've given it some thought, but we've got years to work that one out. Uh, you can either transform floors from generating food because there are other sources of food, and as people have money, they can buy from other places. You can transform the floors to, to create, um, uh, to develop the food, to, to process the food. So if you, you process food from its raw state, um, to uh, some product, um, I'm struggling for an example here, but um, the, um, let's say, uh, uh, 
let's say um, our raw product is fish, and instead of that, we want to can we want to create canned fish. Right, that's a simple one. We put a little cannery on on level four, and we just can fish. So this does a couple of things. It means that our product lasts significantly longer once it's in a can. We don't have to panic for the sale. We can look for a good buyer. We can sell it in bulk because we can um, stockpile it for a while and then sell it. And the income from that can be paid back into the community or used to pay off the original capital cost to make it viable. So that's one thing we can do. And the other thing is that we can just naturally lift the price of the food naturally with the community's capacity to pay until it's on par with other facilities. And then when that community that was in poverty is now no longer in poverty, then they're just buying food like everyone else, except that the food they're buying out of the food cube is organic and it is fresher. Yeah, and they are actually working on it. They become uh, also the producers and suppliers of that. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're empowered and they're involved. And so that, you know, it creates a whole lot of social, good social outcomes because of that. Um, we've designed a smaller one, a 20 metre cube. And, um, um, and that's destined for a community of about um, 350 people, I think, from memory. And we would put that, remember we were talking about vertical villages where we would stack people village on village on village up to four or five floors so that people kept their village social interactions that had more space um, in the homes. Well, we would always put a food cube in there uh, to supplement the rooftop garden. And so the food that comes out of that would then feed, would go into all the, well, there'd be a fresh food market at the bottom, of course, and then there'd be restaurants that would utilise the food and process it. So a, a 20 metre cube works ideally for that, and it just clicks onto the end of that building. It's the same height. Um, and so we looked at that, and we did that not because it was necessary, but because it was possible and it wasn't unfeasible, I guess. Um, and... Um, yeah, look, I guess vertical farming is a very interesting and I think an important uh, thing to, to, to discuss and, and um, look at because, you know, food security around the planet is a big deal. Um, everyone talks about it and, of course, even now we're looking at food chain crises where we can't get food from one end to the other because some lockdown or... COVID crisis, people are isolating or something, and that's causing uh, disturbances in the food chain, which are significant, uh, not just the food chain, but we're talking about food, food security. Um, it's quite possible for a unit about the size of half a small car to feed a family of four indefinitely. You'd be craving something else uh, after a while, there's no doubt, but you wouldn't be dead. And I think that's important. Um, and so you can make aquaponic systems quite small. In fact, um, you know, dollar for dollar, you know, pound for impact per kilogram, uh, the most nutritious thing that a human can eat is arguably a guppy. Do you have guppies in Pakistan? You know what a guppy is? No, I don't think so. <laughs> no, we don't. No, it's a it's a little That's fish. That we have to introduce that, them to. <laughs> <laughs> they're a little pretty coloured fish that children here in Australia all keep for a while. They're easy. They breed like rabbits, and um, but they're tiny. You know, they're they, they, you know they're about as big as the, the the tip of my little finger. You know, that's a guppy. If you eat enough of them, the protein in them is so, and the oils are, are so nutritious that if you had to live on guppies, you could. That's that's a good thing. To and eat. there are algae. Yeah. To eat. I yeah. don't think so. Guppy sandwich. I don't think so. not, not that I've heard of. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, you can make these units very small, and there are a lot of companies who actually make domestic uh, aquaponic systems that you can put on your balcony, off your apartment or your backyard. You know, growing food is actually not rocket science. 
All you need is water, sunlight, seeds. It's the idea. It's the concept that that needs to that needs to uh, to flourish in areas like these because it's it's more of um, uh, people not being aware of uh, what can actually happen that could be helpful for them and uh, also collectively as a as a society or a community. So so once mm. uh, these sort of concepts are in, are introduced. And practically introduced uh, with uh, with some sort of a pilot project going in some sort of an area uh, uh, where uh, there are slums and then there are issues uh, which are eradicated because of the, the by means of these sort of projects. That is when uh, these concepts flourish, and then people get to know more about it. I agree that, and I also would want to add that programs like ours and other programs on YouTube, which uh, which have these sort of uh, ideas and concepts through uh, through scientists and through environmentalists when when it's uh, when people get to see those programs they do apply on a micro level and uh, within their homes and their uh, their communities but um, but this is one of our intentions actually the motive behind uh, these programs is to also bring uh, these ideas to people across to people so that they could not only uh, think about these ideas on a, on a level of a community or a society, but also uh, within their households, within their uh, their reach, where they could apply. Well, see, you've, you've, you've mentioned uh, plenty of interesting uh, things, uh, which I would want another session of ours on uh, on this food cube concept, concept because I know once uh, you elaborate these uh, concepts on uh, our uh, platform on, in, on the YouTube channel, I'm sure people would want to apply whatever they can in their balconies, in the backyards, or, or for their own uh, people, uh, the, the, their, their serving communities, because they know that, uh, you know, uh, what I've seen is that every person over here uh, has uh, the ability, the capability, uh, be it financial or uh, time-wise, that they want to and they can do certain things for uh, for certain people within their grasp, certain communities within their reach and uh, within their uh, circle. So what they do is uh, they tend to uh, pull in funds among buddies, among friends, and uh, and then they build some sort of a micro structure structure for these uh, communities and these people. And then they not only build on it, but they also uh, nourish it for a certain uh, uh, period of time and that, okay, we, we came up with a concept. We started, uh, it's like giving uh, people uh, equipment or skills or uh, a, a school of vocational training or something. I mean, people come up with crazy ideas to to lift uh, certain uh, areas within mm -hmm. uh, their uh, reach. So when you come up with these ideas, when you when you when you mention these ideas, which are uh, which are uh, very innovative and uh, and and uplifting for uh, for uh, the high density slums, as you said, then uh, I, I know that after looking at this program, I'm sure there would be people who would want to gather some uh, uh, some buddies, some friends of, uh, of, a, of a community or on regular meetings. They also, at times, people have to to to, to be able to do something for uh, for uh, for people who are underprivileged in, in some uh, uh, by some definitions. So, so what these programs can do is uh, once they're elaborated in a way that this particular thing could be done in at the backyard of your own uh, home and that could support uh, these many people uh, in the area that are uh, underprivileged uh, by definition so these angles could also uh, be highlighted um, in the future programs mm -hmm. i would say yeah uh, and look um youtube is full of um, people who are doing this stuff on small scale and you can subscribe to any number of them they're great but, but I'd like to put a, a, a warning, a buy, like a buyer's warning on this. <laughs> it's very easy to grow uh, leafy greens and tomatoes and, you know, fruits and things in, uh, in, in um, hydroponics. Um, you've got to really muck it up seriously not to get, you, get, get that working. But when you step, take the next step into fish, don't expect to be an expert overnight. I really recommend you get someone who can mentor you real time. Who really knows that, what they're doing. 
That's what yeah. I think. Programs, programs with uh, f- from people like you who could just uh, you know build an, uh, a series of five programs on a plant, then a series of ten programs on a fish. <laughs> you know these sort of things. <laughs> so we pass. I pass, man. There's plenty of guys out there who will do it. Uh, they're, they're on the internet. <laughs> but a, a friend, a friend of mine, um, who's an expert in uh, aquaponics, said. Uh, he said, and he trains people. He can buy a course and he'll take, take you to the whole aquaponics thing. He said, you know, if you want to go commercial with this, you really aren't good until you've killed about 50,000 fish and then you, and then about then that's when you start to know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, my God. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. that, it's that difficult. You know, the commercial growing of fish is, is hard work and you do need to know what you're doing. Uh, vegetables and fruit, no, not not so big, not so big problem. So I'd suggest you do that first, and then you find the hardest to kill fish you can find. So that'll be catfish, guppies, koi, that <laughs> anything that you can't kill with a stick. You know, like a really tough fish, um, yeah. and use that. It may not taste great, but at least you're not going to kill the ruddy the ruddy thing. And, <laughs> and then you know you'll find a way. It, it, there are ways to kill to eat cooked catfish <laughs> where they taste half reasonably. <laughs> so, so I would suggest that. And then if you if you think you've got that sorted, you you can branch out into tilapia and you know another more exotic, sweeter tasting f- flesh fish. Yeah. Yeah. So just just be aware. It's not it sounds easy. Yeah. Everyone's doing it on YouTube. Uh, uh, uh. So yeah, don't but, be disheartened. Yeah. Is what I'm yeah. saying. Everyone should start, but be aware that fish is a bit of a thing. Get into the vegetables and the and the chickens. Get chickens. I, I, I'm not a nutritionist, but I, I do know, I, I've heard a lot of nutritionists talking to us about this and that, that a human being can survive their entire lifetime on eating just tomatoes and eggs. And I thought, wow, I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and it's fairly easy to grow tomato plants uh, aquaponically. And if you've got a little bit of land, you can grow chickens and get eggs from them. And, and so there's a start. There's food security for a family. Chickens and tomatoes start there and then grow from there. Yeah. For instance, yeah I, think, uh, I think we've uh, extended our time once again. <laughs> but I think... Yeah, but uh, it was interesting. We covered two topics, actually. So today was uh, were very it was very interesting um, on two levels I would say. Yeah, mm. no, there's very a big picture food security, and then there's actually the application of how you might go about that in a very specific scenario with food cubes. Yeah, it's two two areas. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the third program we were talking about town planning, which is uh, Will's expertise as well. So we'll we'll cover that. And then after that, we'll we'll open it up and bring other people into the group discussion, if that's okay. Yeah. And some of the other innovations that are in the pipeline, I think that, that that alone is another program in itself. Exactly, exactly. And as as I said earlier, uh, what I would request uh, will uh, would be that uh, next um, next week, uh, the same day, instead of uh, stepping on to the next topic. I would want a quick, uh, because people were really uh, asking about uh, the first program again. So uh, we could do a quick half hour, 40 minutes uh, uh, recap on the first episode on uh, the, the Piatus uh, concept and, uh, and how it is uh, workable elsewhere. So people uh, would get to see that. And then maybe the next, uh, in the next program, we could go extensively on the third topic. It's just a, a recommendation, a request, because people are asking about it, so I just passed it on. No, happy to, happy with feedback. Um, yeah. Thank you. No Thank problem. you. I think it, uh, it was good. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, both uh, of you gentlemen, of course, particularly Will, because you the extensive discussions that uh, we have with you, I'm, I'm kind of getting addicted to them now, and I'm really looking forward to mm-hmm. The next topic. I'm and, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and the next concept and ideas that uh, we we can uh, 
uh, bring uh, for our people who get to see our uh, channel. And uh, also we would, of course, I on, on a personal level, I also circulate these sort of uh, uh, sessions uh, to different people. And as we said earlier uh, in the, in, during the first episode that we would want uh, at, at a certain point of time, whenever uh, Raza Bhai, of course, and you, Mr., uh, Mr. Marcus, whenever you both decide, we could also bring in people from the government, from the areas, from the industries and from the ministries who, sure. who, who, who are behind the de and designing the policies who actually mean uh, 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 something in, within the system that they can, once they are uh, familiar with the concepts, they can actually uh, make a, a difference and bring, it, bring about a change. So we would do that mm -hmm. gradually. But uh, I thank you both the gentlemen again uh, from the depths of my heart because these uh, uh, points, these ideas uh, are beneficial for everybody that gets to uh, see and hear about them. And, um, and hopefully with the, with the projects that uh, your team is bringing on uh, and about uh, for Pakistan, that we are really, as Pakistanis, we are really looking forward to them. And uh, we hope uh, whatever we possibly can do to, to pave the way for these concepts uh, for, for, for your uh, projects, we are uh, here at your disposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. And um, yeah. I, I think we'll, we're having a discussion with Fred and the team tomorrow evening as well. Is it tomorrow? It's not tonight. Thank you. I thought it was tomorrow, Wednesday, but um, yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll have maybe. a look through. <laughs> okay, guys, thank you very right. much. A, ple a pleasure. It's a pleasure as always, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Take good care. Until next time. Bye-bye. Okay. How do we stop this screaming?